and support groups and individuals. He has appeared before Congress uh, with his analysis on conditions in the text. Um, and you'll find his op ed pieces in publications such as the New York Times, um, Forest to Economic Review, uh, and the Times, and so on. Uh, just a disclaimer uh, Professor Sterling was my MA, uh, MA advisor, so I'm a huge fan. And uh, I know that there are some of his former students in the audience uh, today. Um, and I think we're looking forward to sort of reviewing the good old days when um, going to uh, Elliot's class, you were learning from a top rated historian and a teacher who was extremely dedicated to his students. Um, but the bonus was his talks were highly entertaining. So I think you all get to see some of that today. So without further ado, I will introduce uh, the rest of you. I can hear, uh, yeah, even I can hear myself. Um, um, well, um, I conceived of this, yeah, I think, I think it should be a bit lower. Yeah. I sort of conceived of this as a kind of conversation, or, you know, like, uh, um, I wrote to Christine, I said, and he me with Elliot's um, uh, In other words, I, I thought it would be a, a very informal, there might be like 10 or 12 people uh, in the audience, and we would just have some you know, give and take a very conversational approach to certain topics in Tibetan history. Uh, so I'm a bit uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, um, uh, surprised to see how many masochistic people would rather be sitting, you know, in a library room on Saturday afternoon rather than playing tennis or uh, uh, jogging or, uh, 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 or something else. But uh, for that bad choice, you now have to pay. You have to put up with me. Um, again, I'm. I'm really going to talk somewhat off the cuff. Don't be scared by the papers in front of me. I just want to uh, uh, remember some of what uh, uh, I plan to say. And the um, uh, subjects that I'm going to talk about, largely, you know, what is Tibetan history? You know, how do we know Tibetan history? Um, how do we periodize Tibetan history? They're going to be uh, essentially general. Uh, my aim is to make this accessible, as I said, somewhat conversational. Um, you know, not to get into too many specifics. I don't have a presentation for you. I don't expect you to take notes. So you, can, you, know, you don't have to impress me by writing things down. Uh, uh, you'll all get an A. I mean, it's, uh, you know, uh, nothing to worry about. Um, and uh, I thought that I would be speaking to, you know, a, uh, a lay group, as, as I would put it. That is to say, not an academic group, but a lay group that is interested in Tibet and does have, you know, a, a basic acquaintance with uh, uh, things Tibet. And, you know, I you can always ask you about that. Um, anyway, um, I will probably speak for between, you know, 45 and 60 minutes. That's what I usually say, and I'll, you know, three hours later I'm still going on. And when I said conversation, it was usually because I wanted to just monopolize the entire conversation and uh, 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 going on at, at infinitum. But um, 45 to 60 minutes or until the first person collapses and falls out of the chair uh, uh, out of either exhaustion or mortal. Um, so uh, why don't we start? And the first thing I want to say is, you know, what is Tibetan history? Now, um, uh, those four souls in the audience who actually had to sit through classes on Tibetan history with me know that at some point during the first week, I do uh, uh, throw out the number of 45 million years ago. And that, of course, refers to the point where the uh, South Asia plane, plane crashes into the Asian mainland and gives rise to the Himalayas. Now, I'm not going to go back that far. Well, that's very devious, so I just need to go back that far. So, uh, um, uh, but I'm not really going to uh, uh, go into a uh, uh, day by you know day by day by day by great person, great person, great person account of Tibetan history. But it is a, it is an interesting question. What do we mean when we talk about Tibetan history? Is it just the, uh, the history of anything in that particular landmass? Is it the history of Tibetans as a people? Um, I generally uh, gravitate to the latter, because if you're talking about anything that happens on the uh, uh, Tibetan landmass, you know, we have excavations that go back to the New Stone Age in eastern Tibet, very uh, close to Chongo. Um, a few decades ago, they unearthed, unearthed the settlement, 
And they found in the settlement that not simply roads, but also homes, buildings, maybe two stories. I mean, not uh, extremely elaborate, but the architecture, you know, very simple architecture, was clearly in the style that we associate with today. Flat roofs, sloping walls. I mean, if you know something about Tibetan architecture, of course, you know, you know uh, what I'm talking about. And so the question that comes up is, ah, so we have Tibetan already during the period of the New Stone Age. Now we think about this reasonably, of course, this is not true. Um, we have people on the plateau. Are these Tibetans? Well, we, you know, we don't know. And the question is, what do you mean by a Tibetan? Certainly, linguistically, we don't know who these people are. I mean, you can think about bones, but bones don't speak. And you think about the, uh, uh, the multitude of languages spoken by human beings, and you know that there's very little that you can do in terms of interpreting uh, uh, these things. Uh, then, of course, uh, uh, we have to take account of the fact that there are aerial features which continue. In other words, you have an environment, and you have a response to the environment, which is quite suitable in terms of the kind of habitation. I mean, you think about the sort of architecture you have in the Italian peninsula uh, during the Roman period, and I don't mean the monumental architecture, I mean the sort of homes that people lived in and during the uh, Roman period, and then afterwards and afterwards. And you can see that there are some aerial features which really do uh, uh, um, reflect the environment, and which then continue no matter uh, who is there. So what? You know, what do we mean by Tibetans? Do we mean Tibetans by language? Is this how we understand Tibetans? Those who speak Tibetan language. But when does that happen? When does that happen? When do we speak about Tibetans? Um, you know, one of the uh, early theorists of nationalism uh, posed the question, when is a nation? He didn't say what is a nation, he said when is a nation? And so when do we have Tibetans? Um, in talking about this, in formulating the origins of Tibetan history, um, I have often, and this is, it, it's a very simplistic model that I'm going to give you, okay? But uh, this is generally what I've uh, used in discussing the issue. Um, I think about the Tibetans in terms of the formation of the Tibetans as a people in much the same way I think about the formation of the Arabs as a people. That is to say that a certain, at a certain point in history, you have a dynamic explosion out of the Arabian Peninsula that in very, very quick succession overruns the old areas of North Africa, of Roman North Africa, spreading up through the Fertile Crescent. And when the smoke and dust clear sometime afterwards, everybody is an Arab. Everybody is speaking a variety of Arabic. Everybody is descended or sees themselves as descended from uh, the inhabitants of the Arabian Peninsula. Now, again, you know, all these sorts of comparisons are uh, uh, flawed in some way, but I'm speaking in very general terms. So think about what happens in Tibet. At some point, fifth, sixth century, uh, sixth, seventh centuries, there is a dynamic explosion out of central Tibet, out of the Yarlung Valley in central Tibet, and over the course of a couple of centuries, overruns the plateau. And of course, we know that the Tibetan Empire and the Tibetan Imperial Period, the period in which the Tibetans had a major and important empire, this is from the 7th to the 9th centuries. And uh, I, I really have to stress, and I don't stress this simply because, oh, I'm in Tibetan studies, so I have to, uh, you know, uh, impress you with uh, uh, the military grandeur of it all. No, it's a, it's a fact that the empire created by the Tibetans was one of the major states on the Eurasian landmass during that period, the period from the 7th to the 9th centuries. Uh, sometimes uh, enjoying control over the Silk Road cities, certainly uh, presenting a threat to neighboring areas, particularly China, but a very, very important state. And as I said, this dynamic movement exploding out of uh, this one area in central Tibet, overrunning the plateau, and spilling beyond the confines of the plateau, is crucial in the formation of the Tibetan people which is to say that the Tibetan Empire is crucial in the formation of the Tibetan people. And if I may so, say so, when I talk about that, when I talk about peoples and nations, I'm talking about consciousness, I'm talking about memory, and about historical memory. Not necessarily historical fact, by the way. 
you know, the facts, of course, are important. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I should lay my cards on the table. I'm actually the sort of person that believes in facts. You know, I, I believe there was a Roman Empire. But I also believe that uh, 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 our understanding of facts and our discovery of facts changes things. And sometimes we discover that other things are wrong. To get at the truth, to get at the factual truth of history is a never-ending enterprise. It is a never-ending en enterprise, uh, which does not mean you throw up your hands and you say, OK, well, they're just a bunch of narratives. You know, who cares what the facts are? We try and get at the facts understanding that we are never, ever going to reach the end of the road with that. And that's, that's essentially what we do. We don't have to uh, uh, put a finite end on it. So, the, um, uh, uh, as, I was, as I was saying, it's, you know, facts are important, but it is the understanding of Tibetan history as it is perceived later on, which becomes part of a, uh, uh, a memory of people, which really is important in understanding the formation of the Tibetan people. Um, one thing which I said, I just said before that um, uh, with the formation of the Arabs, when the smoke and dust clears, everybody is an Arab. Now, thanks to uh, the classical historians, and by that I mean the Greeks and the Romans, we really do have a reasonably, reasonably good idea about the peoples who lived in North Africa, in the Fertile Crescent, in the period before the Arabs. We don't have as good a knowledge of the Tibetan Plateau as we would like to have. We do know something. We certainly know something. We have their names. We know about Shangshung. We know about the Sumpa, Kyungpo. We certainly know about the Aja, the Tuyuhun around uh, Kogonor. Uh, uh, you know, uh, undoubtedly proto-Mongols who lived there, who en uh, eventually, of course, were overrun by the Tibetans. Some of them uh, fled to Tang China, others ended up under uh, Tibetan rule. But this is the area that ultimately becomes the realm, if you will, of Tibetan civilization. And one thing which I think is very interesting is that this imperial period really sets the geographical boundaries of the demographic spread of the Tibetans. So that is to say that during this period and afterwards, this is where we find the Tibetan language being used. Now, this is not to say that thereafter every single person was speaking uh, or reading Tibetan. Even today, we have people you know, in Gyarong and elsewhere, and those of you familiar with uh, uh, Tibet will know that not every uh, language on the Tibetan plateau is necessarily a Tibetan or a Tibeto-Burman language. Um, not every language in Europe is an Indo-European language. Uh, don't forget that you have the Basques uh, in the boundary between France and Spain. Um, <clears throat> let me just stop here and ask uh, um, two things. One, um, am I making any sense? Because, I, again, I thought that this was going to be... No, don't be polite and say... You know, okay, okay. And can you hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, um, so anyway, this is, you know, this is essentially you know, how, how I see this uh, business of the formation of the uh, Tibetan Empire. It's crucial. It doesn't necessar necessarily happen you know, during the empire, immediately after the empire, but that event sets the stage whereby, and here I'm going to exaggerate for the sense of making it clear, whereby ultimately, and, and I'm, actually, I'm going to exaggerate for the, uh, 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 for the sake of great drama, too. <laughs> Ultimately, from the boundaries of Kashmir in the west, beyond the shores of the Kokonor in the east, everybody sees themselves as the descendants of a monkey bodhisattva and a rock ogress. Now, with that bit of theater, um, I'm trying to get uh, uh, something uh, clear, which is that what you do have, and I think this is important, is a perception. It comes afterwards, in the centuries afterwards, but a perception of a common kinship. Now, notice that I say perception. I also have to make that clear. There is no such thing as a pure race, no such thing as a pure nationality. But what is important is this perception of kinship. You know, and a lot of uh, uh, people who write about, you know, uh, nationality theory and national theory, you get this idea, you know, and the, the question is raised, um, you know, I disagree with, uh, you know, a, a, a lot of the theorists, but uh, one of them, uh, Walker Connor, who's written about uh, this, I, I particularly 
tend towards his ideas. He makes the point of a, the perception of kinship as being crucial in the idea of a national identity. Some of you who are in academia may know uh, Benedict Anderson's book, uh, Imagined Communities, which really uh, uh, raises this question of how people living thousands of miles away from each other, having no contact with each other, nevertheless can come to see themselves as kindred in some way. What? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, uh, Benedict Anderson re refers to him as well. But the, the thing which, the point which I was trying to make with Benedict Anderson, with his, uh, his, his book is called Imagine Communities. And uh, I think more people have read the title than have read the book. And as a result, many people just reading the title, they feel, ah, I don't have to read the book. Obviously, any sense of nationalism is, nationalism is some sort of mental illness. You know, it's, it's something imaginary. And of course, when you say that something is, you know, uh, imagined, perceived, it's not to say that it's not substantial. Uh, one, one needs to make the same uh, uh, evaluation about being, being a Catholic, for instance. You know, there's no physical Catholicity. Being a socialist, you know, all of this also is, there, and seeing, you know, a, a, a common link with other socialists, this is all in the mind of people. Um, and therefore, Therefore, uh, uh, when I say that there is this perceived kinship, you know, but, you know, I'm not trying to uh, uh, say that it's a, it's a psychological disease which needs to be tra treated or something like that. Um, on, on the contrary, it's substantive. It really is there, even though it is in the mind, even though it is it, it's a perception. It is very real. It is as real as being a socialist, being a Catholic, being a Democrat, being a uh, being an American, uh, being a Russian, being French in the same ways, okay? So um, um, this is, um, you know, th this is where we get some of our basic models from this imperial period. Um, and later on, you know, we find the sort of uh, uh, effect that it has across the Tibetan plateau. In the 12th century, in the 12th century, we see in the Tsongkha area, which is the area uh, around the Kokonor, it's in the northeastern part of the Tibetan plateau, um, a, one of the kingdoms there, and again, as I said, during the Tibetan imperial period, you had this widespread. When the Tibetan Empire collapses, interestingly enough, you know, you have the core in central Tibet, and then you have this area in which you don't have very much, and then the peripheries, in which you do have some very interesting Tibetan states and statelets. And one of them, you know, in the 12th century, they specifically set out to bring a child who is perceived as being a descendant of the imperial line to be the ultimate king of the kingdom. So there is this legitimacy, legitimacy there. There are multiple legitimacies. Um, I should, you know, I should also make clear, um, you know, when I talk about, you know, uh, ideas of identity, and when I talk about uh, uh, legitimacies here. I'm, all, I'm aware of the multiplicity of these things. You have in Tibet, and sometimes people used to say that, oh, well, you know, in Tibet you don't really have a national identity. You have local identities. There's nothing national. Um, and of course, this is a silly idea because there is nothing contradictory by saying you have both. Depending upon the circumstances and where you are, uh, you, know, you, you, you know, you can be Tibetan, you can be uh, Kampa, um, it's all very, very uh, uh, contingent and situational. Um, and multi multiple ways of legitimacy. As I said, you have this kingdom where they bring in someone from the imperial family, from the old imperial family. Ultimately, of course, what we uh, begin to see in Tibet is also the idea of, if you will, spiritual or Buddhist legitimacy. That is to say, the idea that Buddhism also confers legitimacy. Now, Here's where um, um, we get into something that I've, that I've uh, talked about and I've written about uh, on a number of occasions um, in so many different ways that I just hope I can make it uh, uh, somewhat coherent. Uh, Buddhist legitimacy in Tibet um, is not simply a question of, yes, Buddhism is good, it's wonderful, we want somebody who believes in Buddhism. Buddhist, Buddhist legitimacy in Tibet is ultimately the idea of Buddhism to confer legitimacy is something that ultimately brings Tibet into the world beyond the plateau in that post-imperial era. Um, this is a period in which Buddhism goes into decline in India. 
and Tibet, and I'll, I'll talk about you know earlier and later spread when I talk about. Uh, 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 oh my God, I, I feel like I've been talking for five minutes. Uh, 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 I'm on page one. <laughs> um, I'll be talking uh, when I talk about uh, uh, periodization. I'll get into periodization. I'll talk about the earlier and the later spread of the Dharma. Uh, but Buddhist, uh, Buddhism becomes extremely important in bringing Tibet beyond the plateau. Buddhist legitimization. That is to say, with the decline of Buddhism in India, Tibet ultimately comes to be seen, <coughs> Tibetan lamas ultimately come to be seen as the practitioners par excellence of esoteric Buddhism. Okay, now, Buddhism means different things on different levels. What is particularly important is the use of Tibetan Buddhism, esoteric Tibetan Buddhism, not simply in legitimizing, but in empowering. And those of you who deal with Tibetan Buddhism know what an empowerment is. They know what, you know what this means. This is something very, very real. The, uh, well, the perception of it is very real. Um, uh, the Buddhism of a ruler is going to be qualitatively different from the Buddhism of a layperson. And we begin to see, in the 12th century, the presence of Tibetan lamas at courts beyond the Tibetan plateau. Now, this is through you know this early development of, uh, uh, um, shall we say, the later spread of the Dharma uh, 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 inside Tibet, the decline, you know, the decline of Buddhism in India, and ultimately the view of uh, uh, Tibetans as the pra practitioners of esoteric Buddhism par excellence, they come to the attention, these lamas come to the attention of rulers beyond the plateau. Uh, most notably, we find the presence of Tibetans at the court of the Tonguts, a people whom the Tibetans know as Minya. Uh, in Chinese, the state is known as Xixia. And in its later years, it's, ult it's ultimately destroyed by the Mongols. They destroy the Tonguk state. But we know that prior to that destruction, Tibetan lamas are active in the state, conferring empowerment upon the emperor. And when I say that, um, this is not some sort of a pro forma, um, you know, the emperor's, uh, it's an age of faith, first of all. We're dealing with an age of faith. And very often when historians analyze these things, they use the jaundiced and cynical eye of uh, the 20th and 21st century uh, uh, to look back and say, well, of course, nobody really believed this, but it's a way of keeping people under control, uh, you know, by saying that you're, you know, oh, yes, you're so devout, uh, blah, blah, blah. But no, the perception really is there that uh, the empowerment rituals, again, this is tantric, that the rituals are capable of bringing esoteric power. This is a formula I've repeated many times. Uh, bringing esoteric power into the mundane world and putting it at the disposal of a worldly monarch. And this is what was perceived. Um, a number of years ago, I translated something which I thought was one of the Ur texts, or the, uh, 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 one of the oldest or primeval texts for this whole business. It was uh, in a collection of Tibetan texts. And it uh, bore the title of How to Destroy Your Enemies Through Ma. Wait, no, no, no. How do you serve? Now, there's another one, which is How to Destroy Your Enemies. Um, this one is uh, um, uh, How to Usurp Power. And it basically is a text which, according to its colophon, was transmitted directly from Mahakala, the protective form and the fierce form of Avalokiteshvara, to a member of the Tongva, Tisha Minyak, royal family. And later on, I came across an account of the first Mongol siege of the Tongwood capital, a siege that en ended disastrously for the Mongols. They tried to essentially flood the city using uh, engineering works. And it was, it was actually the first time that the Mongols had tried to take a walled city. And this is really the beginning of the spread of the Mongols. And it, it was disastrous. In this account, which uh, at one point turns into a first-person account, and so we know it was a first-person account from the uh, uh, Lama whose biography it is found in, um, talks essentially about using Mahakala, about propitiating Mahakala, and therefore destroying the works. The, about the you know the, the Mongol engineering works collapsed thanks to Mahakala, 
and they drowned. And indeed, Chinese sources tell us the same thing. They leave out the uh, 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 Tibetan connection. Um, I guess they uh, attribute it, yeah, I mean, they do attribute it to uh, uh, faulty engineering. But nevertheless, it's interesting that you find this because subsequently, it is the Mongol prince who is placed in charge of the former Tonga areas who becomes the first person to seek a Tibetan Lama. This is really the introduction of Tibetan Buddhism into the Mongol court. And this idea of legitimation, you know, of uh, 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 legitimation through empowerment has the idea of power. Tibetan Buddhism was meant to bring power. It was meant to bring, bring power. We find hints of this. If you look at Marco Polo, he makes, he makes the case, he, not the case, he makes the point that what the Tibetans were there for, whether they were at court because they could do things. I mean, he, he, and mind you, it's an age of faith. You know, he doesn't attribute it to any great sanctity, he attributes rather to demonic forces. But nevertheless, it's supernatural. And he says the Tibetans were certainly capable of doing that. He describes uh, uh, changing the weather, uh, he describes uh, Hubilai, Kublai Khan, uh, sitting uh, on his throne and uh, 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 cups and goblets levitate and bring all sorts of liquids at the appropriate time to him. Mm. So obviously, I don't have the right empowerment, or I don't know, maybe uh, uh, we don't have the right llamas here, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, this, this, this is sort of like a roundabout hint at the fact that it was power that was at play here. It was really power. It, you know, sometimes, in the old days, when I was a student, when I was a student, and we, we used to read about uh, the development of Tibetan Buddhism at Mongol courts and uh, later at the Manchu court, um, we were told that, uh, I mean, it wasn't a question of power, we were told that, ah, yes, the Mongols were looking for uh, uh, a good moral religion with which to uh, uh, educate their people in virtue, and, uh, you know, it's basically a Sunday school version of how Buddhism came to, uh, 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 Tibetan Buddhism, how Tibetan Buddhism came to uh, spread beyond the plateau. And of course, you know, this is not uh, 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 the case. This is not the way that I see it. Um, okay, um, so uh, getting back to <laughs> what I was saying, there, there really is the formation of an identity that harks back to uh, uh, the Tibetan imperial period that goes on later, that still continues and which becomes important in the formation of the uh, uh, Tibetans as a people. Okay, so we have a, Tibet, we have a Tibetan people. We, you know, I, I would say that we have a Tibetan nation. And uh, again, you know, identities, you know, I, I, I'm not speaking about this in a polemical sense. Okay, I'm just saying that indeed, you can look at uh, many pre-modern Tibetan histories. They don't make a polemical case for the great Tibetan nationality, but they speak of Tibet. They uh, provide stories of the spread of Buddhism in Tibet as a specific area, and Tibetans getting uh, uh, Buddhism in this specific area. Um, you know, I, sometimes when I, I uh, when, when when talks about that, I mean, you'll sometimes hear people saying, "Well, uh, Tibetan is really just a religious identity," and you know, and it's not. And again, I don't mean it in a polemical, a polemical sense. And some people say, well, it's just a cultural identity. But there is behind it what I would characterize as a national history. Again, not polemically speaking, not trying to make you know, an argument on this, but you know, there are histories of an entity which is Tibet, uh, and which has you know, this area. I, you know, I sometimes think of, uh, you know, in arguing this, and of course, you know, given current circumstances, you find yourself having to deal with you know, different sides which are polemical in all sorts of ways, but um, Isaiah Berlin once said something, um, he said that, you know, those who usually uh, uh, look askance at other people's national identities uh, are usually people whose own national identities, you know, are, in no, are, are, are wholly secure, and whom, if they like, can posture about their, themselves being post-nationalist because it, it, it has actually no effect because their identities are so, uh, uh, so secure. Okay, so um, that is Tibetan history, but then we get to the question of when is Tibetan history? How do we periodize Tibetan history? And this is something that I've been giving a lot of thought to. 
There is a recent article by Brian Cuevas, which some of uh, you, I don't, again, I'm not going to delve into academia here. He wrote it in Les Vues des Etudes Tibetains, it's online, and he does a very good job of uh, discussing how certain specific uh, histories, traditional Tibetan histories, characterize the periods of Tibetan history, and how uh, certain modern Tibetan writers do as well. In other words, how do they form, and, and, and it's important to do because if we're speaking about Tibetan history, you know, we have to say, well, what are we talking about in terms of uh, uh, periods? Now, no periodization is completely satisfactory. No period ends or begins abruptly or at a specific time. Um, it, it, you know, there's a, a, a very uh, serious question here, and sometimes I'm rather amused at, uh, at the way we go, go about doing this, and uh, I attended a conference uh, earlier this year in Nepal on uh, the 15th century in Tibet, and of course, it's, you know, you know sometimes, I'm, you know, I, I, sometimes I tend to be contrary, so the first thing I said was, well, there is no 15th century in Tibet. Now, by that, I don't mean that aliens came and basically transported Tibet during the 15th century and put it back. What I mean is that the idea of the 15th century, is that really relevant in Tibet? Um, on the other hand, and I don't want to offend anybody, um, a title such as Ethics for the New Millennium, which is one of the books that the Dalai Lama has written, essentially also the new millennium. The millennium has nothing to do with Tibet, traditionally. Traditionally, it has nothing to do with Tibet. It's a Christian concept. By the way, the century also uh, is a West, you know, uh, uh, it, it, well, that's also a Christian concept because we begin to count it uh, from the uh, 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 ostensible birth of Jesus. And in fact, the way we order time is done in the same way. And as I said, you know, there wouldn't be, a, you know, in Tibet, there's no 15th century, you know, you'd have different parts of different Rakchung, the Tibetan uh, uh, way of ordering time, but no 15th century. Um, and then, of course, I completely contradicted myself since it was a conference on Tibet in the 15th century. And indeed, uh, I, what I said was, the 15th century in Tibet actually is relevant if you understand that Tibet is a part of the larger world. And things going on beyond Tibet actually impinge upon Tibet. It is part of a larger world. And this is, a, a, you know, this goes against traditional uh, Tibetan periodization. Now, there, there are different ways of periodizing Tibetan history. The most, uh, uh, the most simple one that people encounter when they first begin Tibetan history probably is the idea of an early spread of the Dharma and a later spread of the Dharma. Um, that is the period of the Tibetan Empire, and then afterwards, and then starting in the uh, 10th, 11th century, the uh, revival of uh, Buddhism in Tibet, or the new life given to Buddhism in Tibet, and the, uh, uh, and the development also of what we finally uh, recognize as a Pun religion. Uh, the question of what is Pun, you know, prior to this time is very, very problematic. I don't want to uh, uh, really get into it here, but uh, um, this is the most simplistic one. Then there are people that talk about, and actually uh, Brian Cravis uh, uh, mentions that, they talk about ancient Tibet, medieval Tibet, and modern Tibet, which is really a reflection of the periodization of Western history. And, you know, is this reasonable? I actually, when I was speaking about the 15th century in Tibet, uh, uh, well, excuse me, I, I, uh, another topic that I spoke about, which I'll, I'll get to, um, I should get to that in about an hour and a half. Uh, but uh, um, um, the question of the modern in Tibet, because uh, uh, there's a question of medieval Tibet. You know, when people talk about medieval Tibet, and they periodize Tibet as having an ancient, medieval, and modern period, medieval is extremely problematic, because the term basically simply means the intermediary period. But if you speak to people about what is medieval, well, you know, they'll, you know, they'll talk about uh, serfs and feudal manners, jousting, uh, maybe chivalry, uh, all sorts of gruesome tortures, uh, 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 burning at the stake, and uh, you know anything you can go on you can go on about. But really, medieval is just that which occurs in between. But the problem is that, and I, and I mentioned this, um, you have people such as Michael Harris, who was a good friend and was a, and was a very good scholar. He produced a book which was called Views of Medieval Bhutan. I'm sure it must be here somewhere. Um, and without explaining why it was medieval, 
And so should we then assume that everything uh, you know, between uh, the imperial period and uh, the modern is medieval, as Brian Cueto says, is that one formulation, basically you have medieval from the end of the empire, from about the, you know, uh, uh, the 800s to the 1800s, which is about 1,000 years. And of course that sounds somewhat silly, but then I thought, you know, in Western history, that's about, not the same dates, but about the same time span for the medieval period. That is the fall of the Roman Empire uh, in the 5th century, and then at the end of the uh, 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 15th, the age of discovery and uh, 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 globalism, uh, this become, and the Renaissance. So you have the medieval period in between there. But it doesn't really uh, tell us uh, uh, very much. When I said that the 15th century is relevant in Tibet, I was referring to uh, the fact that we have to look beyond Tibet. Uh, now, uh, um, when Brian Quintus wrote this thing, and it's a, it's a very good article, it's a very, very good article, he proposed that perhaps one of the best things to do with uh, periodization is just to be internal, look at internal Tibetan history and go on that basis. And uh, um, there is much to be said for that. Uh, my focus has often been uh, outside of Tibet, or rather Tibet is seen from outside or Tibet looking outside. I do a lot of things with Sino-Tibetan relations. And uh, therefore you need something that uh, uh, somewhat transcends the borders. And frankly, the 15th century becomes very, very interesting. The 15th century is the age of exploration. And it's not simply an age of exploration uh, for the West. People tend to forget that in the early 15th century, China began a very important series of sea expeditions, which had the whole program not been scrapped, well, one can only wonder uh, uh, what might have happened if the Chinese had rounded the uh, Cape of Good Hope and sailed up to Europe. Um, there, are, there are some people who have written a sort of uh, uh, you know, alternative histories about what might have been, what might have been. But uh, this was an age of exploration following the Mongol Empire, the union of Europe and Asia in a way that had not existed uh, for centuries, in fact, in a way that had not really existed before. And now you have the Europeans going down the coast of Africa, Chinese ships from the Ming Dynasty actually reaching Africa. Now, what is interesting about that is that the same bureaucracy that staffed those voyages to the South Seas, to Sri Lanka, to Africa, the same bureaucracy was in charge of dealings with Tibet. So, oh, yes? Yeah. And, and in fact, you can find some of the same people who sailed with the uh, famous eunuch Admiral Junkla, some of the same people are sent to Tibet as envoys. Now, what does this mean? What it means is that we, on one level at least, we should not look at Tibet in isolation. When we're doing periodization, we have to understand that the outer world does begin to impinge upon Tibet. Indeed, indeed, let me, uh, uh, let me rehearse uh, an old theory of mine. Uh, since many of you are new to it, maybe you'll be astounded. Uh, my former students uh, have my permission to go off. Um, but what you find is that this is a period, the 15th century, I should say the 14th and 15th, because remember, nothing, you know, nothing changes dramatically uh, on January 1st, uh, 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 1401, because that's really when the, the 15th century begins. Just as our ethics did not change drastically on December 30, from December 31st to January 1st on either 2000 or 2001, and the same ethics were still uh, uh, valid. But what you have going on during this period is, uh, again, the decline of Buddhism. With the decline of Buddhism in Tibet, you find a marked decline in Tibetan travel to India, in pilgrimage to India. With the decline in pilgrimage, and you can find accounts in Tibetan sources about the destruction of Buddhism, the destruction of Nalanda, and all of that, India does not become a viable place for travel, for much travel, and as a result, not for trade. Pilgrimage and trade are intimately connected, and they've always been intimately connected. And what happens then is that it is the Sino-Tibetan frontier. 
that becomes the most viable frontier for trade. And this is when you begin to see what I, uh, what I think now, it, it, it's interesting when you're dealing with Tibetan history to see how this works. This is when you begin to see what I think is a real population movement to the east. Into the modern period, the bulk of the Tibetan population is outside what is today the Tibet Autonomous Region. Um, now, you know, it's a, it's a very minor difference now, but I think that earlier it was an even greater difference. And you begin to see things happening that, uh, uh, um, that you didn't have before. Um, Chris Atwood, who's a, a very learned colleague of mine at Indiana University, has written an article in which he describes uh, early accounts of Tibetans in Amdo, which make it very clear that they were sparse, they were nomadic, and, Mongol and uh, Mongols and others, including European missionaries to the Mongol court, tend to see them as related to Turks and Mongols rather than Tibetans, whom they knew. Um, it gives an idea of the lack of, shall we say, sedentarization and sedentary culture in that area. I believe it begins to shift with the 14th and 15th century as economic activity begins to shift to the east. Indeed, in the 15th century, Sichuan, which borders Kham, becomes the most populous Chinese province. Again, I think that this is not coincidental. And all of a sudden, you begin to read about trade in that area in, in accounts uh, uh, about uh, the biographies of various lamas. You begin to see more travel to that area. And remember, to invite a lama to come for teachings um, is not, uh, uh, you know, you can't, you can't just say, oh, drop in if you're in the neighborhood. You have to prepare. It's a very expensive proposition. And all of a sudden, you begin to see a lot of disposable wealth in that area. And this, indeed, is part of Tibet's relationship to the outside world. Now, let me add something else to that, to that mix. From around 1550 to 1650, that is the mid-16th to the mid-17th century, um, this is the uh, period that has been characterized as China's silver century. This is the period in which the transshipment, in which the silver mines have been opened by the Spaniards in Mexico, in Peru. And of course, the Spanish base in the Philippines is extremely important for the trade with Asia, which again is the key, is the key to rounding you know, uh, uh, Africa, the key to the, all of this exploration. People were not on these boats because they were having a carnival cruise of some sort. Um, this was all economic. And you begin to see a tremendous amount of the silver being used in the trade with China because now the Spaniards had the Spanish had a new source of trade in the New World that made uh, the Philippines extremely important because that was a base for, you know, for the Spice Islands, quote unquote, and with China and with Japan. Silver begins to flood into China. And I mean, this is, this is, not, this is not something which I discovered on my own, okay? I'm not taking credit for this. This is something that you'll find if you look at monetary history. But then when you begin to look at the records of presentation, from China to Tibetan visitors at the use of silver for purchasing, for instance, horses, all of a sudden there's a lot more silver going into Tibet. And this is also connected to the resurgent economy that you begin to have in Eastern Tibet. One other element which I add, and this again, this is you know, my, my, my hobby horse, um, the destruction of the Tongwood state by the Mongols even earlier help to push this process along by driving a diaspora, a Tonga, Tonga diaspora back into eastern Tibet in the area that is known as Kaminya, the same name as the Tongwood state. Now, there were Tonguids, if you will, Dangxiang, in that area beforehand. It wasn't something absolutely new, but when the state collapsed, many of them returned to the area from whence the Tonguids had come, and their lore, their stories of the Tongwood emperors go into Tibet and become the common heritage, if you will, of people who are there. So uh, I guess the point that I'm making, I, are you following what I'm, I mean, does it make any sense? I'm basically trying to say that, you know, okay, I, I, yeah, I, I, 
I have the, the choir members who say yes. I don't know if any, anybody else is, is getting this, but it has to do with periodization, okay? And it has to do with the fact that Tibet is indeed connected to the outside world. Now let me, uh, um, uh, okay, let, let me just uh, uh, go a little bit further here and take up another issue with regard to Tibet. And uh, maybe this one will be, will be a little bit more interesting to you. You poor people in the front rows, I mean, you have to look alert because I'm looking right at you. Uh, uh, you know, in the back, you know, I guess, uh, I guess the next time I give one of these talks, everybody will sit in the back. Uh, as, as, as a teacher, I know, I know that uh, pattern. Um, anyway, uh, there's a question of the mod, okay? Um, and, and by the way, when I, you know, even if we talk, even if we accept a characterization of medieval, you know, uh, we have to understand that, you know, within Tibet, as it, within different countries, it breaks down in its own way. The medieval period in France has its own particular characteristics, as opposed to the medieval period, say, in uh, uh, Central Europe, in Bohemia. So even using these terms, if one were to use them broadly with regard to Tibetan history, we have to understand that they all have their own characteristics. So this brings me to the whole question of the modern. Now, just as with medieval, you know, where there are all sorts of other characterizations, there are people who don't like medieval, they say, oh, it's feudal, and, feu and by the way, feudal, objectively speaking, you know, is not, you know, good or bad. It describes you know, uh, uh, ideas of land ownership, of uh, 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 relationships between lords and those beyond them, uh, 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 ties to the land on the part of those who have to work them. Uh, we, you know, we need to speak of it objectively. So too with modern. You know, there are many people who like to say, oh no, Tibet was modern. Tibet was modern at this time or at that time. And uh, um, uh, we have to say, what do we mean by modern? And that gets very, very complicated. Um, there are all sorts of different ideas that people have when they speak about what is modern. Some people speak about modernity in terms of technological innovation. Some people speak about modernity in terms of internal awareness. Uh, the uh, rise of autobiography as a mark of modernity. Some people talk about the modern with regard to secularism. And of course you can see this coming from uh, Europe, you know, the idea of more and more secularism. So, what, you know, do we have modernity? Uh, I know, uh, um, you know, I've heard the term internal modernity uh, uh, used by Bob Thurman. You know, he talks about uh, Tibet that, you know, you know centuries ago, Tibet, uh, Tibet had internal, internal modernity. Um, I'm going to skip over arguments uh, 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 about that and really just uh, point to some things which I think are very interesting. Um, Again, Tibet is not isolated. It's really not isolated. The rise of the fifth Dalai Lama, and I'll talk about, it, talk about that in a later, lect uh, later lecture, the fifth Dalai Lama's government, the government of Gandhin Podrang, as we call it. The rise of uh, Gandhin Podrang does not occur in a vacuum. I have elsewhere described Tibet during the period of the fifth Dalai Lama as essentially a Tibeto Mongol state. And indeed, the government of the Dalai Lama, Gandhin Podrang, is really a Tibeto-Mongol enterprise. In many of the older works you read, you, you, uh, the Mongols are relegated to the background. The Mongols show up, they defeat the enemies of the Gelugpa, they hand every, they give the keys to the mansion to the uh, fifth Dalai Lama and say, you know, it's yours, you want it, and then they retreat somewhere. And, uh, uh, they make a little trouble later on, but uh, in point of fact, it was a Tibetan model enterprise. The elite of central Tibet, um, judging from the literary evidence, had no problem with the Mongol language. And I've mentioned elsewhere, at the end of the 18th century, one of the uh, Tibetan aristocrats who served as a minister, a colonel, uh, is summoned to Beijing for all of the uh, 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 mishaps that he caused uh, with regard to the Gurkha War, the war between Tibet and Nepal at the end of the 18th century. And uh, in his own autobiography, he writes, very interestingly, he meets the Qianlong Emperor. And the Qianlong Emperor, this is the end of the 18th century, late 1700s, 1790s, Qianlong Emperor, a very old man, says to him, well, do you know Chinese or do you know Mongol? Because Qianlong even though we know that Qianlong took lessons in Tibetan, I don't, I suspect that he didn't speak it colloquially, but he could 
he could read it, or at least he could pray. He could recite things uh, in, in Tibetan. And so this minister, who had never been in Mongolia, uh, and, uh, and actually his trip to China didn't even go to, his trip to Beijing didn't even go through Mongolia. He went through, he says they passed through Chengdu, then they went to Xi'an, and then they went on to Beijing. Um, in, and he says uh, uh, something along the lines of, uh, um, in Chinese, I know a few words, but I don't know how to put them together. But my Mongol is, well, it's shallow, but, and the shallow, of course, is uh, uh, he's being very uh, uh, modest, because there then ensues a conversation between him and the emperor in Mongol, and you find that several Mongol words are recorded by him in discussing uh, the conversation he had with the emperor. Um, so this is a Manchu, uh, a, a, a Tibeto-Mongol enterprise, this, this state, which is occurring against the background of a Manchu-Mongol world that Tibet was a part of in the 17th and 18th centuries at a time when Europe is coming into Asia in a different way than before. The British are coming increasingly into India. The Russians are coming increasingly into Siberia to the north, to the areas bordering the Mongols and the Manchus and coming into contact with them. And of course, Europeans are appearing on the coast of China. It is a very, very different world. So there are all sorts of different influences there. Tibet gets mapped in a way that it was not mapped before. Uh, in the, at the end of the eight, uh, 17th century, uh, there was negotiated the Treaty of Nerchinsk between the Qing Dynasty and the Russian Empire, delineating the boundary. And as the story goes, uh, the Kangxi Emperor was quite impressed with the maps that the Russians had which were compiled according to uh, uh, modern techniques of mapping. And since Kangxi had at his disposal Jesuits at court, he had them begin to prepare maps of the Qing realms. And this continues through uh, uh, Yung Zhong and, and I think even during uh, the early Qianlong period, uh, it is updated. And eventually these maps come to include Tibet. You begin to have um, shall we say, the first geographical, modern geographical representation of the Qing Empire, of Tibet as well, within the Qing realms, during the 18th century, something you didn't have before. Now, is this an ele element of modernity, the fixing of an idea on paper? Some people would say yes. Um, there are things which I uh, point to, and of course I've uh, you know discussed this with uh, people. There's uh, um, Something very interesting. You know, you think of this period of Ganden Pojang, of the Dalai Lama's government, you say, well, yes, this is, you know, for someone like uh, the Tibetan historian Dunkar Losang Chinle, writing in the uh, early 1980s, this is the apogee of the Tibetan system, the establishment of Ganden Pojang, of the government of the Dalai Lama. But something very interesting happens after the fifth Dalai Lama uh, passes away. There, of course, is a lot of uh, uh, unrest. Um, there is uh, fighting and invasion by the Jungars. And out of all of this comes, in the first half of the 18th century, uh, what I consider a very important uh, event, which is the establishment of rule by Miwon Pola Sonam Tokke. In other words, in the midst of this system of governance by the Dalai Lama, so to speak, the most important person, the most powerful person in Tibet, the beginning of the 18th century, is a lay person. Now, again, I, you know, I don't say, ah, Tibet is not modern. You know, this represents, you know, a kind of secularism. I see it sort of as um, those, those who know uh, uh, old Chinese uh, historical economic theory, you know, the, uh, um, uh, in the old days, uh, uh, the question was of uh, you know how to relate Marxist categories and Marxist periodization to Chinese history, since it all has to come together. And so uh, they, there uh, arose this term, the sprouts of capitalism, to describe those things which were not uh, you know which were uh, anomalous with the idea of China being feudal at a certain time. So all these things that went against the uh, the characterization. Oh, these are the sprouts of capitalism. So. Um, I'm not going to say uh, this is modernity. I'll say these are the sprouts of modernity. 
Um, and of course, you know, all movements like this, history, does, you know, if I say that periodization is irregular, uneven, and uh, problematic, so too are the descriptions of these periods. You know, you'll have a development here, then, you know, step back, and ultimately it may take a while. You may have the sprout of something, the sprout of an idea. But what you have is actually in the middle of the government of the Dalai Lamas, you have secular rule. Now, people say to me, oh, but there have been secular rulers in Tibet before. And that indeed is true. But there was, I, I would say, there's been nobody um, with, whose, whose rule was as important and which was memorialized in one of the great monuments of Tibetan literature. The biography of this person, Miwon Pola, Polane, um, is an it's a, first of all, his biography is marvelous. It's a marvelous work of literature. The language is just beautiful. But it is the biography of a secular person, a man who, as opposed to traditional Tibetan biographies of monks and lamas, in which their work for the benefit of sentient beings, their spiritual activities uh, are in what are, what are uh, uh, extolled. In this book, you know, the Miwon Tokcha, his military prowess, his military victories, and the rank and title that he gets from the emperor, all of these are absolutely important. And there's something interesting. When you look at the Kalafan, the book was written while he was still alive. So, uh, you know, he had a hand in shaping his image. And uh, the author, Dokar Shakun Tseren Wangyal, who is one of the great Tibetan writers, um, notes in the Kalafan that uh, uh, Polane said to him, um, I don't want something that just a bunch of literati can read. I want something that everybody can read and understand. And here he is, he's, it, this extols, you know, the activity of this uh, military person. Sprouts, sprouts. Of course, after uh, after Polone, his son uh, uh, takes power and does not last very long. You know, he is killed, and then we see again. You know, we're back to a very well, very uncertain period. Uh, Dalai Lamas die young. I tend to think that this military episode um, is, in a sense, you know, something which is kind of a sprout, and I. I tend to see, again, you know, this is my own subjective view. I tend to see an echo of that uh, in what happens in 1925. I think it's 1925, when the Tibetan army, by this time we have a Tibetan army, there's been an attempt to create a, a Tibetan army. The leaders of the Tibetan army march into the assembly and demand that the army be treated as a major arm of government. Uh, just as the monasteries, the aristocracy, all of this. Of course, this creates a scandal, and it ultimately leads to the uh, 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 diminution of the army. And people can argue about whether, oh, is this, am I, am I off mic now? I think so. Uh, uh, can you hear me anyway? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so, you know, I, I sort of see the antecedents in that in this period in the 18th century with, uh, uh, you know, Oh, did I, did I crush it? Or, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, well, anyway, I don't have I don't have too much uh, uh, too much more time. Um, I'm running out of material. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, you know what I uh, okay. What what I what I should say is that I see certain elements of what we might recognize as a modernity there, and it's not an isolated modernity. Again, you know, remember this. Polonais, when I speak about him, he is a man in this Tibeto-Mongol Manchu world, a world which indeed is coming ever more closely in contact and touch and influence with the Western world that is marching into Asia. Um, finally, one other thing which I might uh, add, uh, which I find very intriguing, um, the author of his biography, the author of Polonais' biography, is in many ways uh, uh, um, you know in many ways he is an apt 
uh, figure for the sort of speculation which I'm uh, throwing out to you. And it's speculation, you know. This is something that we can argue about and debate. But Doka Shapchung Seren Wangyo is the author of what many people consider to be the first real Tibetan novel. Shunadame. Same man who wrote Polanyi's biography. He is also the author of his own autobiography. Secular man writing a secular autobiography. Secular man writing the biography of a secular ruler. Now, when I say secular, I don't want I, I don't want to give you the idea that Polanyi was somebody who didn't believe. Of course, he believed. You know, uh, 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 you know, there's nothing you know nothing abrupt like that. He 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 was devout, but he was not a monk. You know, these little movements go by fits and starts and by little shifts and degrees. But it's very interesting, not that you know you have a secular ruler in Tibet. There have been other secular rulers, but this occurs right in the middle of this period of Ganden Pojang, of the government of the Dalai Lamas. And it occurs at a time that the world is coming in. So, um, you know, can we talk about the modern there? I think we can certainly begin to talk about the modern in Tibet. Um, anyway, uh, I, I, I think maybe I better stop here because uh, if I keep going like this, we will actually be living in the postmodern, uh, uh, you know, as, as I go on. And uh, I don't want to, you know, pre present, present you with Tibetan history in real time, so to speak. So um, I don't know. I've tried, you know. Uh, again, as I said, I thought I thought of doing this, you know, conversationally, and I don't know, if, you know, if, if it's gotten through. But uh, um, uh, why don't we, you know? I'll stop here. Let's have some Q and A, and maybe that'll be more conversational. So, uh, thank you for for your attendance and for uh, 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 staying awake. If anyone has a question, I'll bring the mic to you. When you were talking before about the interconnectedness between pilgrimage and trade. Yeah and how it fell off in India, yeah. I think you meant in the 15th century. Yeah. Have you written about this anywhere? I'd like to read more about that. Um, I wrote a preliminary article many years ago, and now all of those things are being updated, and they're going into, I've been working on it, they're going into the volume that's coming out of this conference in Lumbini <coughs> on the 15th century. Oh, so um, I'll see yeah. it announced somewhere. Uh, yeah, and I, I mean, among other things, you know, when you begin to look at uh, you know, by and large, you know, you look at things such as the, uh, there's a, um, uh, more and more of these are coming out. I've only, you know, I've only seen a few of them, but there was a three-volume catalog of monasteries in Derge, uh, uh, in Ganze, rather, uh, from some time ago. There's a new volume on Derge. Uh, there's a volume on uh, uh, the Labrang area, the South Gansu uh, area. When you begin to look at those and you see, you know, just, how many of the uh, uh, great great establishments and how many more establishments uh, uh, were done, you know, starting from the uh, uh, 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th century on, you, can, you begin to see a pattern there. And so you really do begin to see the effect of uh, trade. Um, uh, Eastern Tibet really was the most viable frontier for trade. It begins to fall off. Now, it does pick up with India. But what happened in the East is that there really was a disaster as far as this trade goes with India, which shifted things to the East. When India becomes stable again, you'll have the Mughals, for instance, and then later on you have the British, and it becomes very, very stable. There isn't any similar disaster in the East that would then diminish that. But you do begin to see later on trade picking up. There is um, um, there's the very famous journal of an Armenian trader uh, who traded, well, uh, well, from Agra, then he went to Lhasa, and this is in the 17th century, and uh, most interestingly, uh, he goes to Lhasa and he lodges with other Armenians who were already in Lhasa. And then he, then he actually undertakes a trade expedition as far as Chini. Right. So uh, we do begin to see this, but it, ha it doesn't diminish the trade uh, with China. Now, of course, the trade with China in the 15th century was also helped by the fact that uh, there was a hostile border with uh, the Mongol areas. You know, uh, um, China needed horses, uh, and uh, getting horses directly from Mongolia was, was very, very difficult. And so 
the horse trade began. You saw tea horse trading markets established along the uh, Ming Tibetan frontier, extremely important. Um, the horses you know, may well have come from other areas, but they were traded from Tibet. Is there anything specifically on the trade between India and Lhasa? Um, no, not that I, I not that and there I, are little bits of it in many books. Yeah, there are little bits, little bits. You haven't ever written about that. No, 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 no. Um, and you know what we need? It would be great to have. I mean, look, a lot of what I've been talking about here, um, you know, and you know, don't get me wrong. I'm not a total materialist or anything, but a lot of what I've been talking about has been uh, 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 material history. Uh, um, helping us in interpreting <coughs> Tibetan history, rather than just having, uh, you know, a history of the uh, uh, the various Buddhist uh, teachings coming into Tibet. Um, and you have to remember this. You always have to remember when I talk about the 15th, in the 15th century, the 16th century. It's a period, especially. I mean, the 15th century is when you have the rise of the Gelu. Okay, and this is this is quite incredible, um, and very very stunning, and the scholarship that is going on. The debates that you have going on between learned lamas, but you have to understand that there needs to be material support for this. There needs to be material support for the establishment of monasteries, material support for lamas who are spending their time writing and studying and learning. And this is not disconnected from this economic revival, if you will, in the East. And in fact, um, uh, okay, I'm, I, I'm going to try not to be too verbose. I mean, usually what happens is uh, I wind up in digressing, digressing, digressing. Um, what ultimately happens, and this does shape Tibetan history to a certain extent, is that the East becomes crucial. Very interestingly enough, Tsongkhaba comes from the East and goes West at about the same time that a lot of the sects that are established in Central Tibet are making their way to the East. You see the visits of uh, uh, the Karmapa, to the east, and other sects are moving into the east because this is where there is much patronage. Uh, the, new, the, the, the newly wealthy are inviting these lamas. And later on, uh, the Gelupa, who are very well established in central Tibet, need to get into the east. And this is one of the things that happens with Bushri Khan. They wind up fighting their way uh, into the east. But there really isn't, there really is not a good economic history of Tibet. There are a few things. Uh, Christopher Beckwith has written about the Tibetan Empire. Uh, Luce Brunois has written about uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Qing money in Tibet during the Qing period. And there is, you know, there, you know, there is a in Chinese. There's a general. Um, I, I have uh, the name here. Um, there is a general uh, uh, history. It's, no, I, I can't find it. Ah, uh, uh, you know, uh, an economic history of uh, uh, the Tibetan locality or the Tibetan region. But when, when you see the name, you know, you realize already, if I may, and I don't want to be political, but it's already crippled in a sense because it relates only to central Tibet. And you can't really, you know, describe the economy, the economic history of central Tibet without dealing with the East. In fact, it, it, it's crucial with, without dealing with the entire Tibetan plateau. And of course, with my perspective, you have to go beyond the, the, uh, the plateau. Uh, again, you know, when you, when you realize that the people who were on these ships sailing into the South Seas for China were the same people who were trading with Tibet, you know, you realize that periodization and uh, history, you know, it is all linked. First of all, thank you. Um, while you were talking, I was thinking about this, this notion of trying to periodize things as something that might seem to be a very Western sort of concept. Like, we've got to know exactly when things happened, and it started here, and it ended here, and, you know, the need to categorize in a way. And I'm, and I'm wondering, the work of your work and the work of other Western historians how has that been accepted or not, or received, I should say, rather than accepted? How has that been received by colleagues who are non-Western, this, this notion? I mean, I think we, we all seem to operate these days in this 
very sort of structured way, but I'm just wondering um, the sort of artificial construct of that. How has that been received by colleagues who are non-Western non and, um, or is this kind of the way things generally have to be received now? What's so, what's so urgent, and I'm not asking for an answer to that, so urgent about this idea that we've got to know that it happened this time or this time or this time. It happened, and so I'm just wondering if you can talk about that a little bit. Um, well, first of all, periodization is not simply a Western disease. Um, as I mentioned, the Tibetans early on have this idea of the early spread of the Dharma, Dharma and the later spread of the Dharma, which some uh, early Tibetan writers loved so much that they decided that that was the best way to describe Mongolian history. Or I should say, not early, but later writers, so that uh, uh, the uh, introduction of Tibetan Buddhism into the, into the Mongol Empire, the relationship between Kublai, Kublai Khan, and Pagpa is the early spread of the Dharma, and then when the third Dalai Lama meets Altan Khan, that is the later spread of the Dharma. So um, this idea of periodizing things is not simply uh, 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 Tibetan. Um, the Tibetans, you know, have, you know, Tibetans early on have an historical consciousness. Um, during the imperial period, they are writing chronicles and annals. Um, and they're keeping, you know, they're writing, you know, dates and events. Uh, you have these things going on. Um, you know, when I was a student, uh, what uh, uh, um, uh, Helmut Hoffman, who was uh, one of my teachers, used to say was that Tibet is truly the land between India and China. India had uh, uh, no sort of documentary history. I mean, there are uh, source materials that you can use to construct Indian history, but the keeping of uh, uh, history was not considered important. In China, it was extremely important. And in Tibet, you seem to have uh, uh, both of them, in the, uh, uh, both traditions in different degrees. Um, as for periodization, uh, to be quite frank, it's not really been uh, high on the agenda, so there isn't that much that has been written. I mentioned Brian Quivis, and it's a very interesting article uh, that he's written. And he points out in the article that periodization schemes by Tibetan writers, not just modern Tibetan writers, but previous Tibetan writers. So, you know, you have this idea there. In China, of course, you have periodization via dynasties. You have this idea of via dynasties. Now, um, a certain amount of, uh, um, actually, a, you know, a good amount of uh, uh, academic writing on Tibet. Well, not all that much, but there's a certain amount which has been translated into Chinese. Not so much into Tibetan. In fact, very little into Tibetan, but. Uh, in China, there, you know, early on there was a, a series of worldwide zangshia, you know, foreign Tibetology, something, something. There was actually a journal that was devoted to translating foreign Tibetology, then there was a series of books. And now periodically you'll find in some journals somebody translates. Sometimes you'll find it in Tibetan, uh, but you'll, you will find some translations. But to be quite frank, I'm not aware of a, a, a criticism of periodization, largely because the issue really hasn't come up. But it, it, it is a valid issue. Um, I tend to think that it really is contingent. Depending upon what you're looking at, you have to create a kind of scaffolding so that you really can get a handle on things. And it might not be the same kind of scaffolding that someone else uses. Um, when I, I'll, I'll give you an example of this. I wrote, I wrote uh, a piece about uh, Tibet in the 18th century as a Mongol state, um, I, uh, you know, uh, as the Khanate of Tibet, and this, and this, of course, with you know the the presence of the Mongols. As I said, the Mongols in Tibet were not simply there, uh, you know, you know, to get a merit badge, you know, and because they're you know in Tibetan history sometimes, or in the writings of many modern scholars of Tibetan history, you'll find that you know they're they're sort of in the background there. And I said actually, in point of fact. Uh, it really is a Tibeto-Mongol state. I looked at, uh, it, well, in Polonese biography, the descriptions of the army. You know, it's not just a Mongol army, it's a mixed Mongol-Tibetan army. Um, and uh, at one point, he describes the games that they play. And these are like military exercises, you know, war games, like it's equal. But they go on retreat up to the Dom area, the Mongols and the Tibetans. And they're doing all the hunting, 
which is, you know, which uh, by the way is military practice, and you have the Mongols and the Tibetans competing with each other. Clearly, it's a mixed Mongol-Tibetan force, uh, 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 which you have there. And so, it, you know, as I said, periodization is based upon perspective. Um, I, I basically concluded the article by saying, you can write a history of India from the mid 18th to the mid 19th century based in Fort William, Calcutta, or you can write a history of the very same period based in Agra at the Mughal court. These are two very different histories, but each one of them is valid. And in the same way, you could write a history of Tibet from the mid 17th to the mid 18th centuries from the perspective of the Mongol encampment in Dom, or from the perspective of the Otala Palace. These would be very different histories, and each one would be valid. And in periodization, I basically feel the same way. And this was a, a, a way of, you know, my basically making this a sort of, uh, 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 you know, introducing the concept of the Khanate of Tibet, which, by the way, I, after I described my ideas, it was my colleague Chris Atwood who coined the term, oh, you mean the Khanate of Tibet? Uh, because we have all these different Mongol Khanates, and in a sense, it's the Khanate of Tibet. Um, and at the same time, it is Dandan Hodam, you know, the uh, uh, regime of the Dalai Lamas. Um, it, you know, it might sound contradictory, but we, ha we have to open ourselves up, you know, to these multiplicities. I talked about multiplicities of identity, multiplicities of periodization. We, these are tools. You know, in a sense, we're not discovering periodization as an end in itself. We use periodization as a tool to get to something else. I don't know if that makes makes sense. Yeah. I'd like to also thank you for for being here today. It's great to be back in college. <laughs> oh, that, that's terrible! I meant no, it to be a conversation. <laughs> <laughs> It's wonderful. It's I'm going to cry all the way back on the train. Now. <laughs> sure. Um, I, I'd like to know if the uh, biography and novel and autobiography of the author that you mentioned, who who wrote about the secular military leader, have they been translated in English? All of them. I am right now working on a translation of the biography of Polanyi. The novel by Dokar Shapchen Tsering Wangyal was translated by Beth Solomon. I think it's called The Tale of the uh, Incomparable Prince. Um, check it on Amazon. Yes. And I believe Dokar Shapton's uh, The Kalan Tokcha has been studied by somebody in your, in your row. Hurry. Thank you. You can have a preview here from our collection of stuff you find. Any other questions? Thank you for your talk. Uh, it's really impressive. And um, you talk about the beginning of the Tibetan history, and you made a comparison. I like that um, with the Arabic. But uh, I'm wondering, uh, what do you think is the, I mean, fundamental reason for the beginning, the, the great explosion of Tibetan civilization? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you talk about the empire, but that's for me is just something that is exterity. But uh, what is the um, fundamental reason, the internal dynamic uh, factor? For, is it language, or the politic structure, or the Buddhism, or all of them? That's my question. Thank you. Boy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, this is one of these existential questions, you know. Uh, uh, why was there a Mongol Empire? Why was there an Arab Empire? Um, you know, sometimes, you know, you think, you know, for instance, you know, if the Tonguts had managed to destroy the Mongols at that attack, you know, what would history have been like if uh, um, the Byzantines had forced back the Arabs? Um, the, you, know, if the, you know, if the Tibetans had been destroyed at Sungpan, um, it's very, very, you know, it, you know, it's very difficult for me, for me to say, but in all these cases, the dynamic seems to be uh, the struggle for power in this small area, which then begins to, you know, you know, without defeat, it spreads, it spreads, it spreads. Um, 
what is curious, of course, and uh, my colleague Chris Beckwith has written about uh, this period being one in which there are empires forming all over Eurasia. It's the period of the Frankish Kingdom. It's the period of the Tang Dynasty. It's the period of the Turkish Empire. The period of the Uyghurs. The period of the Tibetan Empire. Uh, Tibetans, Uyghurs, and Turks all get Tu Juan in the uh, uh, Tang, in, both in the Zhou Tang Shu, the Old Tang history, and the New Tang history. So, you know, they're all major states uh, uh, at this one time. Um, we could look for all sorts of causes. Uh, um, the attraction of the Silk Road. Was it the Silk Road that, and of course, the Silk Road became the focus of struggle. Uh, you know, controlling, and again, you know, I'm being very material here, but I'm, I'm looking at it in terms of, you know, economic uh, 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 reasons. Um, you have all of these things. The Tang historians blame Gar Dongzan, or rather they, you know, they credited Gar Dongzan with uh, uh, all of the uh, uh, Tibetan, the early Tibetan mil military successes. And indeed, by the end of the seventh century, um, he had basically put what we now consider Amdo in Tibetan hands. And that's what, you know, this is, this is the person from the time of Song Singapo, up until, uh, you know, well, his family, uh, actually he and his family, managed to effect the conquest all the way up to the uh, Khopanor, up to uh, 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 So, you know, the fact, I don't know. Uh, uh, it's nice that there are always questions that are not answered, because uh, if I may be very patronizing, we have to be patronizing <laughs> students. You know? <laughs> But you know, it's 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 a great question. It's a fundamental question, and you know, again, when I when I talked about the you know that we must always go after facts, we always must always look for the facts in full knowledge that we're never going to get to the final accounting with them, and this is one of the things that you know it's one of those questions that you know we may have an answer proposed, but somebody else will come along. Um, just recently, you know, there's been a, a, a lot of argumentation over uh, what caused the plague in Europe. You know, whether the whether indeed it was the Mongols, the Mongol invasion, you know, into Yunnan, which brought this uh, vulnerable population, which you know had never been exposed to such diseases. If they're the ones that then carried it forth and ultimately set you know the plague back to the bacillus on its uh, uh, route across Eurasia, ultimately, you know, through, the, uh, uh, through Crimea and down to Venice and Genoa, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, somebody said, no, 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 it, it would not have been possible. I, I, I haven't read, I've just seen, you know, the, uh, the indications of this uh, ongoing debate. That was something that we thought was uh, settled, now we know. So. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Professor, for the lovely session. Uh, my question, I want to take you back to the 7th and 9th century. You talk about uh, Tibetan king, very powerful. What is your assumption um, about the population-wise uh, in Tibetan area? Um, is it more than 6 million? Uh, <clears throat> um, were, were there more than 6 million Tibetans? I would doubt it very much. Um, the uh, the whole population question is, is really fraught. Um, you know, the, uh, we don't really have valid uh, or you know, reliable uh, population estimates until the early 1980s. Even the 1982 census in, in places like Tibet, and in some places they had to extrapolate. Um, I think the uh, um, uh, uh, figures that we have now are reliable. Uh, but to go back to the period of the empire, you know, I have no idea. In the, uh, uh, in the seventh century, according to the Tang record, Song Singampo fielded an army of 200,000, I think, uh, when uh, uh, they descended upon uh, uh, Sungpan, what, you know, Sungjo, Sungpan, uh, 200,000. I think that would have been absolutely impossible. Um, Mind you, a friend of mine many years ago said uh, uh, that this was not impossible. There were undoubtedly emanation bodies that were uh, manifesting themselves. And, uh, but, um, and you have to remember that this, you know, uh, to have been defeated and then ultimately finally stop the Tibetans, um, a general in the field who's defeated by a bunch of Tibetans, of course, is going to say, well, there are 200,000 of them, you know. Uh, 
Um, we, you know, we don't, uh, we don't really know, and it's very difficult to say. And of course, this is a period when you wind up with different populations being assimilated through this process that I talked about. When the smoke and dust clears, we know about, you know, uh, Chang peoples, you know, and not all of them remain as Chang. Many of them are assimilated into uh, 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 what today uh, is Tibet. Look, all sorts of things are very mixed up. Uh, um, there's an author, Orego, who wrote about uh, the massive, massive Turco-Mongol population in medieval Italy. You know, where did it go? Well, it went into the gene pool. And we have all these different populations, the Aja, the Tuyuhun, um, who lived around the Pocono, extremely important people. They're destroyed by the Tibetan state. Where do they go? Into the Tibetan gene pool. Tongos go into the Tibetan gene pool. And we know Mongols, whom I've mentioned, into the Tibetan gene pool. Um, but how many, what the population was, it's very, very difficult to say. Uh, even Sogdians come into Tibet during uh, this imperial period. But uh, to be honest, I know of no reliable uh, statistics. I think uh, many years ago, Tom Grunfeld, in one of his uh, uh, works, had a list of populate, you know, and he tried to go by that. And of course, it's completely uh, uh, meaningless. Anything that you get before the 20th century, um, it, 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 you know, it's, it's not done scientifically. And you know, the six million figure uh, in the 20th century um, you know, is clearly not reliable because that six million figure is given every year practically uh, by the Tibetan government in exile. Uh, that there are originally six million Tibetans, and, then, and we know that there were mass deaths on the Tibetan plateau. But there are still six million Tibetans, and you know, it, it, it's just not a reliable figure. One last question. Yeah, um, sorry. You haven't spoken about uh, uh, Link SR. Uh, do you think it's an epic or? Is... Oh, I think it's, it's an epic. epic. I, I think okay. I think we agree that it is an epic, okay. uh, a a multi multi volume epic. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, um, this is Berlin. Thank you so much for um, this wonderful talk. I think you gave us all a lot of things to uh, Was it think about. Was it really conversational? Yes. So, so okay, I, thank you. you know, I have questions. Um, I'm quite struck by the idea of the Tibeto Mongol, um, idea of the Gandhi Kodong being a Tibeto uh, Mongol enterprise. So I was just wondering if you could, you know, speak a little bit further about sort of the internal logic and the nature of that relationship and that enterprise, um, and how that kind of manifests in sort of the administrative, legal kind of uh, governance structures, um, particularly in a sense that, you know, after the fifth great fifth passed away, you know, the, his region, Desi Sangi, so sort of kept, kept that in secret for you know decades. Yeah. Um, so I'm just wondering if you can, especially because, you know, history in this uh, contemporary you know, uh, politics is, uh, there are a lot of implications for those things, and different um, folks have different yeah. opinions on that. So I'm just wondering what you meant by, you know, Tibeto-Mongol enterprise, and what it really means. Well, what, it, what I mean is, you know, often what we're told is that uh, uh, the Mongol armies of uh, Gushri Khan uh, essentially uh, conquered Tibet for the Gelugpa, for Gandhi Pojang, and the Tibetans were essentially, you know, either you know, the people working in the fields, the nomads, or the uh, lamas. And the Mongols were doing all the fighting. And first of all, uh, the armies that took the field were Tibeto-Mongol. And in the biography of Polonais, this becomes very, very clear. Polonais' um, Polonais, uh, grandfather and his father all served in the forces that fought, you know, under the Mongol banners in Ladakh. And there were lots of Tibetans. There were lots of Tibetans who did that. And in fact, Polonais, uh, I, I wrote about this in an article. I, I forget the exact link. Polonais uh, was considered to be the incarnation of one of Bushri Khan's grandsons. Uh, so this is extremely interesting. I sometimes say, ah, secular incarnation. Um, uh, but I mean, uh, th 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 that's the old way in which. Uh, before it, uh, you know, reincarnation became, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, formalized as an administrative tool for sectarian continuity. Uh, you know, so, oh yes, you know, so and so must be the incarnation. Of that. So we have the army is uh, Tibeto-Mongol, but there are many elements which may, do make it unstable. 
Um, and that is to say that uh, you have Bushri Khan, who is the king of Tibet. Lhasa Khan, of course, his grandson, uh, uh, wants to exercise greater power. And this leads to the conflict with Desi Sangye Gyatso, because essentially the, you know, the, uh, 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 the might, if you will, the force, is on the Mongol side, although it is Tibeto-Mongol. Um, one thing which I think is Im important is that you have to know that a lot of this is personal. The administration of Ganden Pojang, a lot of the administration, of course, is monastic, you know, in the Potala itself. But outside, you know, you do have officials, you know, officers, certainly army officers, who are the enforcers of the regime, who are Mongol. Let um, me see, I, was, I forget what it, I was, something else had come to me about this. Yeah, oh yeah, the, uh, uh, it was personal. The actual administrative might of the organization was personal. There was no, and this is an interesting thing to think of, to, to, to think of there was no Tibetan national army. Even though this was a state with enforcement mechanisms, there was no national army. I saw, and I don't want to offend anybody by saying this, but um, the structure was very much like what we know of the structure of the mafia. And not that they were doing anything illegal, but it's just that you had, you know, the captain, and then you know, you know, the uh, was it the uh, capo di tutti capi, and then the other capos underneath and underneath, and the soldiers essentially had personal loyalty to someone, so that when Polanyi's close comrade in arms, Kangchene, was killed, there was a mini civil war in 27, 1727 and 1728. When Kong Chene is killed, um, there is a report sent by one of the uh, uh, Manchu observers in Tibet at the time. And he says, Kong Chene's soldiers now don't know what to do. Some of them uh, are going to, some of them think they're going to go to Polane. Some of them think they're going to go to the Dalai Lama. And in other words, they were without a head. This was not a national organization. It was very, very personal. So. Um, I don't know as much as I would like to know. I hope to know more about it when I finally finish with the uh, Polanyi biography. But there are already, I think, tantalizing ideas about the 18th century Tibet that uh, come out of it. Yeah, 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 Thank you for your inspiring talk. Um, as you mentioned, we should um, pay much attention to the uh, plural perspective of uh, Tibetan history. So I wonder how to rewrite Tibetan history nowadays. Uh, for example, I'm interested in primarily in this is Gyatso, and the Tibetan writers always praise him like um, the, name, the ethnic hero or great writers, but the Chinese historians might criticize him as a betrayer. And it's very interesting because the previous scholars most discussed the, the story of Gyatso uh, depends on the Chejong or the something like Namtar. And you will like the, the, the story of, well, about well this this Sangyazo really get along or really treat the six Dalai Lama Sangyazo very well, but based on the records uh, from the, uh, the Manchu and Mongolian archives, that this Sangyazo even want to kill the friend of Sangyazo and want to manipulate him as a puppet, and the Sangyazo finally um, fight against with the, uh, this Sangyazo. So. I'm wondering, is it possible to rewrite Tibetan history past beyond uh, nationalism, both in the Han Chinese or Tibetan perspectives? Thanks. Um, <clears throat> absolutely. And when I said that uh, you know this is an ongoing enterprise, uh, I can tell you that Tibetan history is going to be written and rewritten and rewritten. Um, there's so much that we don't know. And even with regard to Desi Sangye Gyatso, there are an awful lot of things. I mean, um, look, I don't have access to the Potala archives. So, you know, there are a lot of things which uh, 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 I cannot say about that. But, um, you know, the story of Desi Sangye Gyatso is very, very complicated. And yes, there are some people, um, you know, one of, the, uh, uh, one of the things which, you know, you know keeps getting bandied about uh, by Desi Sangye Gyatso, and there are even uh, uh, still, modern Western writers who write that he was this, the natural son of the sixth of the fifth Dalai Lama, um, which uh, is an impossibility. I can tell you, it's an impossibility uh, um, by the timeline. 
And it, it, you know, it's interesting actually that you see um, this pops up, this story pops up in uh, um, certain Western books, but it has not really, it's accepted. You know, some people, and, and in fact, actually, it early it comes into the West very, very early on, I think, with uh, Kurdish and Choma. But some people say, oh, yes, it was a Western concoction. You know, there's, you know, they, one finds no Tibetan sources for this, but indeed, there is a Tibetan source for this. Um, Leilung Shepe Georgie writes about it. Um, uh, Desi Sangi Gyatso becomes a very controversial figure because of what happens in Tibet. Uh, the Jungar Mongols come in, they kill La Sang Khan. And uh, you know now the interpretation of Tibetan history is that uh, I, I hope I'm not going to lose all of you in this, but I mean, um, you know, every time that I have to teach what happens in the early 18th century uh, in the Tibetan history class, it's sort of like um, I got charts with Jungars and Lhasa Khan and Desi Sangye Gyatso, and the you know, and the arrows going all over the place. It's very, very complicated. So uh, uh, just bear bear with me just for a minute with this. Um, uh, you know, Desi, you know, Desi Sangye Gyatso was basically put to death, you know, uh, 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 by the orders of Lhasan Khan. And when the Junglars come in uh, and they kill Lhasan Khan, of course, you know, they're, uh, uh, you know, they're looking for ways of discrediting Desi Sangye Gyatso as well. But the interesting thing is, and this actually has bearing on the whole Shukden business, but uh, the Junglars also uh, uh, believe the rumors that the fifth Dalai Lama was not. Uh, legitimate. And so uh, Leilung Shepe Dorji, who was in Lhasa at the time, is called in by the Jungars again asking him these questions. And this is where he reports it. He said, is it true that the fifth Dalai Lama was not legitimate? And, you know, uh, this is the, uh, what it, Kim Kong Ok Kituku, the, you know, the, the other candidate for the position of fifth Dalai Lama, who then becomes key in the whole story is about what, what later became the whole Shukden controversy. You know, wasn't he the legitimate one? And is it true that the fifth Dalai Lama did not really have all the vows and that he didn't observe them? And is it true that the fifth Dalai Lama, uh, oh yeah, was, what, is it true that he wasn't really recognized fully by the Panchen Lama? And wasn't it true that he then fathered a son and that son was Sangye Gyatso? And this comes in a contemporary source, and they don't shape it, what He's responding, says, no, no, I, you know, as far as I heard, you know, he's legitimate. Of course, he's sitting there in front of the Jungars, but he's making the case that no fifth Dalai Lama is legitimate. Um, nothing about this uh, Desi Sangye Gyatso being the son, but clearly the rumor about Desi Sangye Gyatso. And the, the, this is all part of an attempt to delegitimize the fifth Dalai Lama on the part of the Jungars. So the whole thing is connected. Uh, but that rumor is there at that time. Later on, I think the first person to write about it uh, in Tibetology is uh, uh, Choma de Kurush. You know, so this is you know the early 1800s, and then it gets picked up and picked up, and the next thing you know, uh, Giuseppe Tucci is saying, of course, as we all know, well, he doesn't say that, but he says, you know, you know, obviously he was the the son of the fifth Dalai Lama, and in point of fact, and this was shown, uh, I think, most convincing convincingly by Chen Ching Ying, uh, a great Tibetologist who, um, I often say, if Chen Ching Ying wrote in English, uh, our, our ideas about uh, 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 Tibetan history would be, would be different, or the general ideas would be different. But um, he wrote about this very extensively. But he didn't realize that the rumor actually does go back to Tibetan sources that uh, uh, we have later in Shepe George's account in which he's questioned as to whether uh, uh, Desi Sangye Gyatso, and he's writing contemporaneous with the uh, Jungar invasion in the early 18th century. Uh, I apologize for that uh, 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 digression uh, through things that are not really conversational or more academic, but it's an interesting topic. And uh, anyway, everybody loves stories about uh, so-called illegitimate children. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. You're speaking on multiple legitimacy and national and local identities. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe talk more about it. Like, if you, I was wondering if you've noticed an evolution or a change in the way that Tibetans identify themselves um, nationally, locally, um, and also um, if 
like the ways in how a Tibetan in Central Tibet would identify themselves versus a nomad Tibetan, a nomadic Tibetan in Amdo? There's no absolute way. It depends upon the situation. It's all contingent. And uh, that's why you really have a very strong sense of national identity since 1950. Because the situation has changed drastically. And so what is a Tibetan? That has also changed drastically. Um, uh, you know, a, a, again, you know, e but even today, I know people, the first thing they say, I'm a Kampa. You know, before they'll say uh, anything like that, and anything about uh, you know being a Tibetan. Um, there's a, a there is a place in which uh, the state also tries to shape identity. Um, you know, it, you know, and I, I think this is known to most people, but you know, within uh, uh, the modern People's Republic of China, you know, when one is Tibetan, one is of Tibetan nationality. In other words, you know, uh, Puri, not Pupa, but Puri. Pupa, of course, uh, uh, are people in the Tibet Autonomous Region. But everybody, everybody all together are Puri. You know, they are people of Tibetan nationality. Um, what I find interesting about this is that we have literature from the time of the Long March in the 1930s. Uh, the Chinese Red Army, when they marched through Kham, they established their, uh, of course, these didn't last long, but as they were heading to Yan'an, with, or rather, to their eventual uh, 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 headquartering in Yan'an, they passed through Tibetan areas and they established uh, 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 local Tibetan people's governments. And when you read the literature in Chinese, the term they use for Tibetan is not Zangzu, you know, or uh, Puri, but Huoba. Which, which means pupa, which, you know, in the current uh, uh, scheme of things, should only apply to those in central Tibet. But clearly, it's being used for people outside Tibet. So one may make the case that, well, they must have heard this locally, you know, rather than, uh, 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 you know, having flown somebody in from Lhasa to ask, you know, uh, uh, what the term was to be. So um, these things are very, are, are very fluid. But, uh, um, one identity has not extinguished the other in terms of, you know, uh, a Tibetan identity vis-a-vis uh, -vis a local identity. It just depends upon, you know, your circumstances. You know, there are some instances in which I'm a New Yorker, period. And then I'm an American. But, uh, you know, sometimes being a New Yorker really trumps being an American. And for well, some Tibetans I know, being a Kampa is, you know, is, is, you know that's the main thing. And not only that, being a, you know, uh, I don't know, Jay Horpa, you know, uh, uh, that can sometimes be the most important thing. It depends. You know, there's no, uh, 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 you know, final answer that fits every situation. Time for one more question. Um, my question is, oh, actually, hello. Uh, my question is, why is this in-depth study of Tibetan history important? And how is it useful to the situation that Tibet is in right now? That's really interesting. I mean, you know, my very flip, casual answer would be it's important so that people like me can get employment. Um, <laughs> but in point, in point of fact, what you're actually asking is whether something should be studied for for want of a better term, simple lust of knowing. We want to know. We want to know, because I think this is a basic human thing. Or should all knowledge be utilitarian? And should it all be used only to meet, well, sometimes a political end? And you get this all across you know, the different issues of the, uh, 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 the different uh, sides of the Tibet issue. I think, I think knowledge has its own intrinsic value and that you might not understand uh, or you might not find it useful at this particular time does not uh, devalue it. Um, I think in terms of politics, one should always act on the basis of knowing as much as one can. I would like to, I mean, I, you know, I would like to live in some pure pristine world where politics doesn't influence, but of course it does. Um, there are many things that influence us and perhaps prejudice us, but we need to try and uh, um, 
uh, account for them and to try and understand as objectively, I know people hate this word, as objectively as we can, knowing that we'll never reach a point of pure objectivity. I mean, my attitude is that even though we can never be purely objective, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. As opposed to say, okay, well, let's just uh, you just throw out any attempt at, uh, at objective truth and let's just uh, uh, go with you know whatever narrative uh, we have. Um, well, it's no secret you can look online and find. I, you know, I try and you know uh, um, keep my, for want of a better word, polemical writings separate from my scholarship. And I like to think that I've been able to do that. I mean, if you want to find. Uh, you know, what I think polemically, some of my political ideas on the issue, I mean, they're very, very easy to find. You can just go online. But um, I like to think that uh, um, the way I look at things uh, historically is indeed uh, objective. Um, it does not meet the, <clears throat> I mean, to be quite, to be quite frank, uh, um, I have, you know, I've been criticized by political parties on, different sides for different reasons. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to, you know, some people get up and say, oh, I'm neither pro-Tibetan nor pro-Chinese, and I'm right in the middle. You know, that's for the reader to decide. You know, I just try and, you know, find what I can, and then I leave it to the reader to decide what they think uh, 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 of my opinion. You know, and if they think that I'm, you know, that I'm uh, uh, being prejudiced or biased in what I write, then, you know, so be it. But. Uh, um, I just, I just, you know, I'm like everyone else. I'm just trying to do the best I can, you know, with with the limits of the human condition. And thank you all. Thank you so much, Elliot. So there's three more of these talks uh, this fall. Um, the next one being October 10th. And if you haven't done so already, if you could uh, sign up by sending an email to uh, events at trace.org, or we have the sign-up sheet outside. Um, this one was really overbooked, and uh, actually we're not going to, Facebook is not really the official way to do it, so if you could send us an email, that would be great. And uh, before that, we do have a film screening, that'll be next Thursday, October 17th. That's Dorjit Sering Chinatsang's film, uh, uh, Yardsa Rinpoche, Precious Caterpillar, about the uh, caterpillar fungus Yardsa Gumpo. It's, it's really an amazing, uh, intimate documentary that follows uh, one particular man in the trials he endures in trying to uh, collect this Yardsa Gumpo. Um, and on September 26th, Rinchen Darlow uh, will be talking about his hometown of Mienang, or in Nyalam, as it's sometimes uh, or is now known. Um, the horse looks back, and if you could also RSVP, that should be a very interesting talk. Um, okay, thank you so much, Elliot. <laughs>